It's true as we look around us, a lot of things are changing. We're doing things differently than we did even a few months ago. But we need to rest on the fact that no matter what changes are a certain constants in our world, that Jesus Christ is still the Son of God and He is still Lord and He is with us. And He has sent the Spirit to us to help guide us through things. And no matter what, we need to stay focused on those basic fundamentals of our faith. So we may find that we have to do things different. We may wear masks for a while. We may do some online services and online meetings. But we will still worship God and we will still worship God together. That has got to be our commitment. And as we talk about that as we're talking about this is Pentecost Sunday. And you see up there the title, Finding Your Fire for God. That's what we need to do. Are we on fire for God or have we lost some of that fire? And why? I know some people are fired up for God. I hear it. But some of us need to find out what it is. So we want to open up this morning, if you'll stand with me, and let's read our opening scripture as we read what happened on that day that we talk about that we call Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask now that you would bless this uh, reading of your word and that you would allow it to come alive to us. We ask that you would speak to us, allow us to grow. We ask us you to reshape us if need be so that we will be more receptive to your spirit in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. As we look back here on the time of the Passover, this was a, uh, or the Pentecost, we realized this was an, a, one of the uh, important celebrations that were taking place. From my reading, there, there's a number of feasts and festivals that the Jewish people had in their, custom, uh, in their year. But there were three great Jewish festivals, the Passover, the Feast of Weeks, or Pentecost, as it's also called, or the Feast of Tabernacles. These three were so important that any Jewish male that lived within 20 miles of Jerusalem was pretty much obligated to show up for it. So you're talking at the time when Pentecost happened, Jerusalem was packed. There was huge crowds because everybody came for this uh, Feast of Weeks. Pentecost itself means the 50th. And the reason for that is it was the 50th day after the Passover. And that's when this takes place. The Feast of the Week celebrated two significant things. Historically, where this really started, it commemorated the giving of the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. Remember we got the law on the tablets? That's what we're remembering on this thing. The other was an agricultural significance. We're thanking God by bringing his first fruits and we're offering them as a sacrifice to him. And that's what the purpose of this feast was. Now, when Pentecost came, you have to realize the timing of what's taking place in here. It's a packed city. I'm thinking it was a city with a lot of uncertainty because this happens nine to ten days after the ascension of Christ. 
So think in mind, we talked about at Easter time how when Jesus was crucified, how there was so much turmoil in this city because there were some pro-Jesus people and there were some who opposed to Jesus. And how, depending on what part of the week, uh, who was celebrating and who was torn down, and now suddenly everybody's scattered when he is crucified and nobody knows what's going on and then suddenly you get the spark of hope again because Jesus has risen from the dead and some of us have seen him the stories start to spread and then nine to ten days before this he has ascended into heaven he's gone again and they basically have been told to wait for the Holy Spirit I think this is a time of uncertainty as they are. But the crowds were all in the city for this great feast. The disciples, it says, are all together in one place. So here they are gathered together. And I'm thinking they had to have mixed emotions. The Spirit hadn't come on them yet. And at the same time, those who were trying to put the final squash on Christianity were out persecuting Christian, Christians. So they were probably being a little bit careful at first. You know, what do we do? What can we say? What's going on? Are they going to come for us next? But there were those who still held firmly to their faith in Christ. And then we're told that the Holy Spirit fell mightily on the disciples. And when this happened, it said there was a sound like the blowing of a mighty wind. Can you imagine that? Big old winds coming through this building. And I think we'd all be taking cover and wondering what's going on. And then tongues, something like tongues of fire came to rest on each one of them. It said it came between them and came to rest on each one of them. Anybody ever see anything like that? I haven't. And it said that they had the power to speak in tongues suddenly and power to mightily spread the gospel of Christ. So all of a sudden they came alive and they started testifying for Christ and they were no longer hiding, they were no longer timid, they were no longer weak. They were going out and spreading the gospel. They were just on fire. And that's what we were looking for is that fire. Now, contrary to what some think, the Holy Spirit didn't first come at Pentecost. Some people think that this is when the, Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was suddenly unveiled to the human race. No! This was just a mighty outpouring of the Spirit that took place here. So much that this mighty Spirit is what launched the church. This is what started our present-day church as it went out and spread the gospel. But it hadn't happened many times before. You've got to remember that God is eternally Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He was before time and he is will be forever. Just like Jesus didn't first when he came as a man. That wasn't where he started. He was there before time. He was there in the beginning with the Father. He just came as a man. The Holy Spirit was there before. And our authors recognize that. Because in the book of Acts, the book of Acts, one of the things you can talk about the book of Acts, if you want to see how the Holy Spirit works, the book of Acts talks about the Holy Spirit throughout. It talks about what it was doing in those days, but they also reference some historically. In Acts 1, and 15 through 17, we find, In those days Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David, according to Judas, who served as a guide for for those who arrested Jews, Jesus. Right here you were talking about Peter is acknowledging that the same Holy Spirit that gave him power now gave power to David. That's in the Old Testament. So obviously this is not the first occasion. And as we go on, we find other people saying the same thing. In Acts 28, we find Paul had made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your forefathers when he said this, when he said through Isaiah the prophet. So here you have Paul also making the same statement. The same Holy Spirit that is guiding me and is guiding our people now guided Isaiah. That's where this word all came from. And then Stephen said this right before being stoned to death. Stephen made the statement, he said, You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Just like your fathers. He was talking about our forefathers who were resisting them there. So he said the, the Spirit was active back then. You just ignored them. You rejected them and you wouldn't yield to them. A lot of people say that Pentecost was a one-time thing. There was never anything like it before and never like it. 
And the truth is, we may or may not have another Holy Spirit movement, movement, Holy Spirit movement like that took place at Pentecost. But the Holy Spirit power is still available to us today. Are we going to tap into it? That is what is going to guide us through the future of this church. That is what is going to guide us through all the tough times that are taking place in this world right now. We've got diseases we don't understand, and everybody's got different opinions, and everybody's arguing. And right now we have riots going on in the streets. We have people destroying things. Why? The lack of God in their lives. That's the only thing you can tell. People want to look and say, uh, we need our government to solve things. We need our educational leaders and schools to step up. It will not be solved till people turn back to God and yield to Him and put things right in their lives. Because if we develop proper children now and raise our children to believe in God, they will be our future le leaders who will leave by God's will. When you walk away from God, you've got problems. we look at what took place in the Holy Spirit in the early church, we find that the Holy Spirit was the source of all guidance. In Acts 8, 29 we find, the Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Remember when the Philip, when he went to preach to the Ethiopian, why was he there? The Holy Spirit said, go to that place. And when he went to the place where he was told to go to, he saw the opportunity that God had placed right in front of him. That was a little thing of nothing more than being in the right place. We need to look for the Holy Spirit's guidance in everything in our lives, even the little things. And leaders of the church were men of spirit. In Acts 6.3 we find, Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them. Where did this place take place here? This is when the disciples suddenly realized they were overloaded and they couldn't do it all themselves and they had to go out and reach and say, hey, I want Tom, I want Bill, I want Louette, you, I all need you to do jobs. And they chose leaders to help in the church. But oftentimes in the church today, people forget the fact that we need people who are led by the Spirit to be our leaders. Who do we do? We choose leaders sometimes because they're popular or because they have some kind of business background. Oh, he runs a business. He knows how to do this. He understands all these business principles that we need to grow our church. Nothing wrong with those things. Those are great if we can get that. But if that person doesn't have the Spirit of God in them, it's not going to work too well in the church. It will actually destroy the churches. A lot of churches have been destroyed because they're not being led by the Spirit. We need spiritual leaders in our church, and we need spiritual leaders in our businesses too. We need to look for that. And the Spirit was a source of day-to-day -day courage and power. In Acts 4.31 we find, After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. I believe this was Peter who went out and spoke boldly. But when all this happened... It was in day-to-day -day life. It wasn't just in coming to church on Sunday and say, praise the Lord and hallelujah, and we're all excited because we're in the house of God. It's in everything we do seven days a week. Even the little mundane things. God's got to be there through every day-to-day -day activity to give us courage and power. But we find that the degree to which we can possess the Spirit is conditional by the kind of people we are. In Acts 5.32 we find we are witnesses of these things and so is this Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey Him. We can't ask God to give us the Holy Spirit and then go out and do everything the way we want to. We have to know God's laws, know God's commandments, know His leading. And there are some things in our lives sometimes we have to weed out. Whether it be activities, places we go, people we, uh, we're dealing with, or attitudes. Those things all have to be changed. We have to look to live, God, live God's way. If we don't do that, why would the Holy Spirit want to use an impure vessel? He is looking for us to meet him on that road to purity. He wants to have holy people. 
The day of Pentecost is a one-time occurrence. We will never see that again, maybe. But the moving of the Spirit is constant. It's happened from the day we were created, and it'll happen till the day Christ uh, returns. Other great movements have, recurred, have occurred when God's people were obedient. Think about it. The Protestant Reformation. You think that wasn't Spirit-led? God found people who were obedient and following him and who said there's something wrong here, we've gone off course, and he led them to change the way we worship today so that we could find a path closer to him. How about revivals? How many have heard of great revivals that have happened throughout history? Do you think that wouldn't happen if there wasn't someone who had gotten there? I haven't had the time in preparing this to study all the history of revivals, but I can guarantee you that somewhere at the root of all those were revivals, there were men and women of God who were faithful and submitted to the Spirit and got down on their knees and prayed for that revival to happen, and they were led by the Spirit to allow that to happen. Many of these great moves of the Spirit have occurred during times of crisis and uncertainty. Usually that's when things change in our lives, when we've hit rock bottom, when we're going through struggles. It's not when things are going good. You think things are good, everything's great, but it's suddenly when you hit rock bottom. I know it was that way in my life when I have been the closest to God is when everything was falling apart. That's when we open up and allow God to work. But the question is, can it happen again? Can it happen in our lifetime? Could it happen right here in Phillipsburg? I believe it can. In 2 Chronicles, we find, If my people who are called upon my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now, some people will say sometimes when we see an old scripture like this, that, oh, that was a promise God made for that particular time in that situation, and everybody wants to claim another promise. That promise may have been made, but what that showed was the heart of God. And I believe that principle still applies today. That is a principle, that when people decide to get rid of the junk in their lives and fully submit to Him and serve Him, that He is willing to come and work in them through power. We don't know in what format. Could we literally see another Pentecost type of experience? Or could we see something even greater? I don't know if we'll see it in our lifetime or when it's going to happen, but I think that there is going to come a time when the Holy Spirit will move so mightily that Pentecost will look like child's play. Can you imagine that? So what, here everybody's talking about the new normal, right? What is the new normal? They say, oh yeah, we're going around with masks. We've got a distance. Social distance, they call it. I hate that term. Somebody else pointed out it should be physical distance. We don't want to stop socializing. If we couldn't meet together, we met online if need be. We're social people. We were created to be that way. But what if the new normal was more about us giving up our old ways? What, if the new, what is the new normal for the church? Giving up our old, old ways and fully surrendering to the yielding of the leadership of the Holy Spirit. What would happen if we really could tap that deeply into the Holy Spirit? Because we got away from all the distractions and the things that were stopping us. So if you want to find your fire for God, you must be willing to obey God in all things. Rely on God as your source of guidance. Day to day, not just periodically, a day to day source of guidance. And you must yield to the lead, uh, uh, leading of the Holy Spirit in your lives. When He tells you to do something, you say, oh, I, can't, I can't do that. They'll mock me. I don't have the power to do that. I don't have the strength. That's right, you don't. That's why you need the Holy Spirit. God will do through you what you could never do yourself. That's how we find our fire for God. By totally being obedient, totally surrendering, totally yielding our own selfish ways of doing things. And when we do that, 
God can work mightily in our lives. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message. We thank you for your presence in our lives. We ask, Lord, now that you would examine our hearts and see where are we holding back? Where are we maybe being rebellious or disobedient? We ask, Lord, that you would examine that in our lives and you would rip that out of us and you would take full control of us, Lord, and allow us to totally yield to your leading in our lives. We want to be fully yours, Lord. We want to sense your Holy Spirit in a stronger way. So we ask now, Lord, that you would guide us, enable us, and empower us. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.